Okay, so today we're diving deep into the early Christian church, right after Jesus, you know, departs from the scene. It's a fascinating period. It is. We're really digging into the book of Acts. Yeah. And not just the stories, but the historical context, the big theological ideas that make this book so important. We've got some pre-passages lined up, so buckle up because things move fast in the early church. Miracles, persecution, some serious life changes. It's true. Acts is like this really important bridge between, you know, the Gospels and everything that comes after in the New Testament, right? Right. It shows us how this tiny group of Jesus' followers goes from this place of confusion and fear to actually spreading Christianity across the, you know, super powerful Roman Empire. And it all starts with that feeling of what now? Right. After Jesus ascends. Exactly. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says they're in Jerusalem, just like Jesus told them, waiting. Yeah. And then, boom, Pentecost. Right. We see this in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Holy Spirit descends. They start speaking other languages. Oh. And suddenly they have this power to take Jesus' message far and wide. Talk about a power move. It says thousands of people convert after Peter preaches on that day. <gasps> thousands. But that kind of rapid growth, you know, it's got to ruffle some feathers, right? What happens when the established authorities catch wind of this? Yeah, so in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it tells us the religious authorities, the priests, the Sadducees, those in power, they're not happy about it. They see it as a threat and start persecuting the early Christians. It's so interesting how they try to silence Peter and John initially. It's almost like, stop talking about this Jesus guy. Yeah. But then... In Acts chapter 4, verse 17, Peter's response is essentially, nope, can't do that. We've seen too much. We've experienced too much to stay quiet. Right. And then what does he do? He heals a lame man yeah. right there in the temple. Acts mm -hmm. chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Yeah. It makes you wonder what those in charge were thinking at that moment. I know. It really makes you think about how deeply convinced they were. They weren't messing around. And we see this in Acts chapter 2, verse 32. This wasn't just stories to them. They had witnessed the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit firsthand. So when they were told to be quiet, their faith was obviously stronger than their fear. And that boldness lands them in even hotter water. Imprisonment, threats. We see this in Acts chapter 4, verse 3 and chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Thank goodness for divine intervention. Acts 12, verses 7 through 11 describes an angel springing Peter from jail. Talk about an escape plan. That's a good one. But you know, that's not the only dramatic transformation we see. We have got to talk about Saul, later known as the Apostle Paul. Talk about a plot twist. From Christian persecutor to one of their most powerful advocates. It's quite the story. Paul's conversion is really a pivotal moment in the early church, wouldn't you say? Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 kind of set the scene. He's literally blinded by a light on the road to Damascus. He hears Jesus' voice. Talk about a life-changing encounter. It really makes you wonder, if someone like that can change so drastically, is anyone truly beyond redemption? It's a question that I think still resonates today, and it's part of what makes Paul's story so compelling. Yeah. His transformation, which we see in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, reminds us that radical change is possible even for those we might least expect it from. And you know what's remarkable? He immediately dedicated himself to the very people he had persecuted. Wow, what a 180. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, though, how did that go over? Did the early Christians just welcome him with open arms? Well, not exactly. Imagine it from their perspective. Right. This was the man who had been imprisoning and even killing them, as we see in Acts chapter 9, verse 21. Of course. So trust doesn't come easy, right? Yeah. Especially in the face of past persecution. So how did he win them over? I mean, he didn't exactly have a great track record. Right. It took time, it took patience, and it took the courage of other believers, like Barnabas, we see him in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, to actually vouch for Paul's sincerity. You know, they'd witnessed his transformation firsthand. Okay. And they were willing to risk their own credibility to kind of build a bridge between Paul and the rest of the believers. Wow. But even after he was accepted, the opposition didn't stop there. Right. We're talking beatings, imprisonment, even shipwrecks, all detailed in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Chapter 16, verses 22 through 24, and chapter 27, verses 1 through 44. Mm. This guy was through it. Yeah, and Paul actually recounts these trials himself in Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 21, when he's talking to the Ephesian elders. Oh, wow. He says, you know, with a lowliness of mind, with tears, and with trials, that's how he describes his service. It's powerful. Yeah, he faced physical hardship and also internal conflicts within the early church. Right, like that whole debate about circumcision we talked about earlier. Exactly. It even caused a rift between him and Barnabas over John Mark. 
We see that in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. It's interesting, you know, even back then, building a new movement wasn't all smooth sailing, right? Yeah. They had their share of drama and disagreements, just like, you know, any group of people trying to figure things out together. Oh, absolutely. It highlights this very human element of the early church. These were real people, right? With flaws and passions, disagreements, all striving to live out their faith in a complex world. Right. I think their struggles make their accomplishments even more remarkable. Absolutely. And speaking of remarkable people, Acts introduces us to a whole cast of characters, not just Peter and Paul. Oh, absolutely. It's not a one-man show. It's the collective story of all these different people caught up in this movement. Right. For instance, there's Stephen, who performs amazing miracles but is eventually stoned to death for his faith. You can read about that in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, and chapter 7, verse 58. He becomes this powerful symbol of faith and sacrifice for the early Christians. His death must have sent shockwaves through that young community. Oh, I'm sure. And then there's Philip preaching to the Samaritans, baptizing an Ethiopian eunuch. We see this in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, and verses 26 through 40. That's right. And what about that story of Ananias and Sapphira? Oh, yeah. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. It's a stark reminder about honesty and integrity within the community, especially when you're dealing with something as powerful as the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And these stories, they're often overlooked, but they add this layer of complexity to our understanding of the early church. It wasn't just about Peter and Paul. Right. It was about the collective faith and the witness of all these different people, each playing a vital role in this movement's growth. They weren't just preaching to friendly faces either. No, not at all. These early Christians were venturing into some pretty hostile territory. Can you imagine trying to convince a group of Greek philosophers in Athens that their idols were meaningless? I know. Paul definitely didn't shy away from those challenges. We see this in Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 28. He's engaging with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill. He even quotes their own poets to make a point about the nature of God. Talk about knowing your audience. How did that go over? Did they all suddenly decide to follow Jesus? Well, let's just say Paul encountered a real mixed bag of reactions. Some mocked him, but others were intrigued and wanted to learn more. You can see that in Acts chapter 17, verse 32. It's so interesting how the early Christians tailored their approach depending on who they were talking to. All right. With the Jews, it was scripture, arguments from the law, and the prophets. We see this in Acts chapter 28, verse 23. But with the Gentiles, they focused more on God's revelation through creation, that idea of a universal God. It really speaks to their adaptability and their understanding of their audience. Right. And this ability to connect with diverse groups of people, you know, meeting them where they were at. It was crucial to the spread of Christianity. Totally. And it's a principle that I think is still relevant today. It really is. It makes you think about how the early church would approach sharing their faith in our modern world. It's a good question. It's clear they were willing to go to great lengths, face in persecution, navigating these cultural differences, constantly adapting their approach. Yeah, they were dedicated. They were. It definitely provides a lot to think about. It does. You know, their experiences, the good and the bad, offer really valuable lessons for us today as we grapple with our own faith journeys. Oh, sure. And how we share those beliefs with the world around us. Right. Yeah, their commitment to spreading the good news is really astounding. And, you know, it makes you think about the challenges they faced. It really does. And the motivations that kept them going. They were navigating cultural differences, very real dangers, and yet this faith continued to spread like wildfire. It's almost like the Roman Empire, by trying to keep things under control, kind of inadvertently helped Christianity spread, you know? Oh, that's interesting. How so? Well, think about the Roman roads. They were built for military transport and trade, right? But they also made it a lot easier for those early missionaries to travel around. So Paul and others could cover more ground, reach more people. It's like the empire's own infrastructure became a tool for spreading the very message that they opposed. Exactly. And it wasn't just the physical stuff. The common language of Greek, you know, used throughout the empire for administration and trade, that became a unifying factor for these early Christians. It's amazing how something intended for one purpose can be used for something completely different. But let's not forget about those who actively worked against these early Christians. We've talked about the Roman government's opposition, but there was also pushback from some within the Jewish community as well. That's right, yeah. The early Christians were really caught between these two powerful forces, often facing suspicion and persecution from both sides. And the reasons for the opposition 
were complicated, to say the least. Okay, so let's break it down a little bit. We've talked about how the Roman Empire, despite itself, kind of provided a setting for Christianity to spread, but also actively opposed it. Mm -hmm. What were their main concerns? Well, for the Romans, it really often came down to loyalty and power. The emperor was considered divine, right? Demanding allegiance to him was non-negotiable. So the early Christians' refusal to participate in emperor worship, it marked them as different, even dangerous. So their unwavering faith in Jesus as the one true God, the one true king, was seen as a direct challenge to Roman authority. Exactly. It wasn't just about religious beliefs. Right. It was about political stability. From the Roman perspective, you know, these Christians were disrupting the established order, mm -hmm. potentially inciting unrest. It's a stark reminder that even back then, that line between religion and politics was often very, very blurred. Absolutely. And it wasn't just the Roman government, right? Many within the Jewish leadership also opposed the early Christians. Why was that? They were coming from the same religious tradition. They were, but their understanding of the Messiah differed greatly. Many Jewish leaders, they were expecting this powerful political and military leader, someone who would overthrow Roman rule, restore Israel to its former glory. Right. And Jesus, a humble teacher and healer, well, he didn't exactly fit that mold. So when the early Christians proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah, it created this major rift. Precisely. They were accused of blasphemy, of spreading false teachings. And we see instances of this throughout Acts Acts chapter 13, verse 50, chapter 14, verse 19, chapter 17, verse 5, Paul and the other apostles, they encountered hostility, even violence, from some within the Jewish community. It's kind of amazing how a message centered on love and forgiveness could spark such intense opposition. Right. I think it really speaks to the power of this new faith to challenge the status quo. The early Christians were introducing this radically different way of seeing the world, one that transcended these cultural and religious boundaries, and that was incredibly threatening to those in power. And yet, despite the very real dangers, the persecution, they persevered. How do we even begin to understand that level of courage and commitment? It's truly remarkable. Think about Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. They were preaching boldly, even after being arrested, threatened with punishment. They could have easily just backed down, you know, kept a low profile, yet they chose to speak out, even when it meant putting themselves at risk. Exactly. And we can't forget about Stephen, considered the first Christian martyr. Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60, describes his death, stoned for his beliefs. Wow. Yet even in those final moments, he showed incredible courage, forgiveness, even praying for those who were killing him. It's an incredibly moving story, a true testament to the power of faith in the face of death. It really is. And then there's Paul, who we've talked about, beatings, imprisonment, shipwrecks, you name it. His list of trials is almost unbelievable. It's true. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28 details the hardships he endured. It makes you realize that following Jesus during that time, I mean, it wasn't easy. It came at a real cost. It did. And it wasn't just the apostles. Countless ordinary believers whose names we might never know faced similar challenges. That's right. They risked everything, their families, their livelihoods, even their lives for their faith in Jesus. It's humbling when you really think about their sacrifices, their bravery. It is. It makes you wonder what I would have done if I was in their shoes. It's a question worth thinking about, that's for sure. Their stories challenge us to examine our own lives, our own faith. Yeah and ask ourselves, what am I willing to stand up for? What am I willing to risk? Their stories are such powerful reminders that faith isn't always easy. Sometimes it requires a lot of sacrifice. But even in the midst of that hardship, there's this incredible sense of joy, even celebration throughout Acts. Oh, absolutely. Despite the persecution, despite all those challenges, there's this like undercurrent of joy, this contagious enthusiasm that just permeates the early church. We see it in the explosive growth of the early church, thousands coming to faith, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and chapter 4, verse 4. Yeah, and it wasn't just about the numbers. It was about the miracles that accompanied their ministry. The healings, the casting out of demons, even raising the dead, as we see in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, and chapter 9, verses 36 through 42. Wow. And these weren't just isolated events. These were signs and wonders pointing to the very real power and love of God at work in the world. It's like God was saying, I'm here, I'm moving, and nothing can stop what I'm doing. Exactly. And that sense of God's presence, his power, his love, it infused everything they did. It gave them the courage to face persecution, the boldness to share their faith, and the joy to celebrate even in the midst of hardship. 
And that joy, that celebration, it wasn't limited to individual experiences, though, was it? It mm. really permeated their life together as a community. You're absolutely right. Acts gives us these amazing glimpses into the life of the early church. Right. And it's clear that their shared faith created this deep sense of unity and love. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and chapter 4, verses 32 through 37, describe this community that was radically generous deeply connected, fiercely committed to one another. They shared their possessions, cared for the poor, supported each other through thick and thin. It's a really powerful picture of what it means to live out the gospel in community. It's a model that still inspires, still challenges us today, you know? For sure. In a world that often feels increasingly divided, I think the early church's commitment to unity, to generosity, to love, it stands as this really powerful counter narrative. It really makes you think, yeah. you know? How can we, as followers of Jesus today, cultivate that same spirit of unity and love within our own communities? It's such an important question to explore. Maybe it begins with just recognizing our shared identity in Christ, remembering that we're all part of one body, one family. And our differences, while important, shouldn't divide us. They should enrich our understanding of God and his love for the world. Exactly. The early church's example reminds us that unity doesn't mean uniformity. It's about embracing our diversity, valuing our differences, and finding ways to work together towards a common goal. Right. And that goal is sharing the love of Christ with a world that desperately needs it. Okay, so we've talked about the context, the challenges, the courage, the joy that characterized the early church. But let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the spread of the gospel. Okay. It's really quite remarkable how quickly it spread throughout the Roman Empire from a small group in Jerusalem to reaching essentially all corners of the known world. I know, it's really astonishing. And I don't think it was just about the message itself, as compelling as it was. Right. There were very specific strategies and approaches that contributed to this rapid spread. So what were some of those strategies? What made their approach so effective? Well, one key element was their mobility. Instead of waiting for people to come to them, they went to the people. And we see this throughout Acts, with Paul traveling from city to city, preaching in synagogues and marketplaces. He even shares his faith in prison, as we see in Acts chapter 17, verse 17 and chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. Wow. They weren't kidding around. They were pioneers, venturing into unknown territory, driven by a passion to share the good news. Yes, absolutely. And they were adaptable. Right. They tailored their message and their approach to connect with all these different audiences. We talked earlier about how Paul, when speaking to Jewish audiences, would often draw upon the Old Testament, connecting Jesus to their shared scriptures. We see that in Acts chapter 17, verse 2, and chapter 28, verse 23. Exactly. He met them where they were, using their familiar language, their familiar scriptures, to build a bridge to the gospel. But when he was speaking to Gentile audiences, his approach often shifted. He talked about God as the creator, the one who gives life and breath to all people, emphasizing God's universal sovereignty and love. We see this in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 28. It's a really good example of contextualization. Understanding your audience adapting the message, but never compromising the core truth. Such a valuable lesson for us today to remember that while the gospel message is timeless, how we share it might need to look a little different depending on who we're talking to. It's about being relevant without compromising, you know? Right. About meeting people where they are without losing sight of where we want to lead them. And it wasn't just about preaching, right? It was also about discipleship. It was about nurturing new believers in their faith. Oh, absolutely. The early Christians understood that making converts, that was just the first step. They were committed to walking alongside these new believers, providing guidance, support, accountability. It was about quality, not just quantity. Exactly. They focused on building strong disciples who would, in turn, make more disciples. It reminds me of that image of a farmer scattering seed. Yeah. Some falls on rocky ground, some among thorns, but some falls on good soil and produces a bountiful harvest. That's such a powerful analogy, and the early church understood that not everyone who hears the gospel will respond, right? But they also understood that those who did respond, they needed nurturing and guidance to really grow strong in their faith. So how did they do that? How do they go about discipling these new believers? Well, they used a variety of methods, but I think one key element was mentorship. 
We see this happening throughout Acts, Paul and Barnabas. They would appoint elders to lead these new churches, providing oversight and guidance. We see that in Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Right. They also wrote letters to these churches, offering encouragement, instruction, and correction. And these letters, now part of the New Testament, they were more than just theological treatises. These were personal communications addressing really specific issues and challenges that these early Christians were facing. It's amazing to think that those letters written centuries ago still speak to us today. They do. Still offer guidance and encouragement for our own faith journey. They remind us that the challenges we face as believers, they're not unique. The early church grappled with doubts, they faced persecution, they struggled with internal conflicts, just like we do. And yet they persevered. They found strength in their shared faith, in the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of God. It's true. Their example is both humbling and incredibly inspiring, and it reminds us that we're not alone in our struggles. Right. God is faithful. Yeah. His grace is sufficient no matter what we're facing. Okay, we've yeah. talked about their strategies for sharing the gospel, for nurturing these new believers. But there's another element that I think is absolutely crucial to their success, and that's prayer. You're absolutely right. Prayer was the bedrock of the early church. It wasn't just something they tacked on at the end of a meeting. Right. It was woven into everything they did, their ministry, their decision making. We see them throughout Acts praying for boldness, for protection, for guidance, for healing, for the spread of the gospel. They understood that they weren't in control that the success of their mission depended entirely on God's power and his provision. And prayer was their lifeline to that power, their way of tapping into the infinite resources of heaven. That's a beautiful way to put it. They were constantly seeking God's will, asking for his guidance, and trusting in his power to accomplish what they could not do on their own. So how do we, I mean, it's easy to talk about, but how do we incorporate that kind of dependence on prayer into our own lives. Right. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to live it out. Exactly. It takes intentionality. It takes discipline, a willingness to surrender our agendas to God. Right. And I think maybe it starts by simply acknowledging our need for him. Right. Recognizing that we can't do this on our own. Humility is key. Absolutely. And then it's about setting aside the time, creating space in our busy schedules to connect with God, to listen to his voice, yeah. and to seek his guidance. And it might look different for everybody, you know? Yeah. But the important thing is that we make it a priority. And not just praying for our own needs, but also for those opportunities to share our faith, for boldness to speak up when we see that opening. Yes. For the wisdom to know what to say, how to say it. Exactly. And to pray for the people that we're trying to reach, that their hearts would be softened, their minds open to the truth of the gospel. Because ultimately, it's not about our eloquence or persuasive skills. Right. It's about God's spirit working in their hearts. It's about partnering with God in this work of redemption, recognizing that he's the one who draws people to himself. Our role is to be faithful witnesses, to share the message and to trust him with the results. And that requires a lot of faith, especially when we don't see immediate results. Hmm. When our efforts seem to be met with indifference, maybe even opposition. It does, but the early church's example reminds us that faithfulness isn't about success rates, it's about obedience. It is. It's about doing what God has called us to do, trusting that he's at work even when we can't see it. Right. And believing that he will be faithful to accomplish his purposes. Their story is such an encouragement, you know, to keep going, even when it's tough, even when we don't feel like it, because we're part of something so much bigger than ourselves. We are. We're part of God's redemptive plan for the world. Wow. And that's a story worth telling, a mission worth dedicating our lives to. Yeah, it's inspiring to see that level of dedication facing such intense opposition, yet clinging to their faith with unwavering conviction. It makes you think, what was it about their beliefs that gave them that strength? Well, I think it goes back to the very core of their message the transformative power of the gospel. This wasn't just a set of rules or rituals, you know. Right. This was a lived experience of God's love, his grace, his power at work in their lives. It wasn't just about believing certain things. It was about encountering the risen Christ. Yeah. Just like Paul on the road to Damascus, yes, right? Yes, exactly. And it was this encounter, this personal transformation that fueled their courage, their message. Absolutely. And this transformative power, it wasn't limited to the apostles or early church leaders. 
Acts is full of stories of everyday people, men and women, slaves, free people, Jews, Gentiles, whose lives were completely changed by encountering the living God. It's a beautiful reminder that this gospel message, it transcends cultural, social, even religious boundaries. Mm -hmm. It speaks to something deeper, right? It does. To those deepest longings of the human heart. Hope, healing, purpose. No wonder they were willing to face persecution for it. Absolutely. It really makes you think about those theological insights we can get from the book of Acts. You know, what does it teach us about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the very nature of the church? It's like we've been on this incredible journey through history, right? Witnessing this birth and explosive growth of the early church, and now we're left to unpack the deeper meaning. It is. It's a rich tapestry. Yeah. And I think one of the most prominent threads is this deity of Jesus Christ. Oh, for sure. We see this affirmed over and over again. Jesus being worshipped, receiving prayers, being proclaimed as Lord and Savior. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Chapter 7, verses 55 and 56. And chapter 9, verses 5 and 6 all offer glimpses of this. Exactly. Acts doesn't shy away from declaring Jesus' true identity. He's not merely a prophet or a teacher. This is God incarnate. And what about the Holy Spirit? What does Acts teach us about his role in all of this? Uh, the Holy Spirit. Acts is often called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Right. Because his presence and power are just so evident throughout the entire narrative. He's the one empowering the disciples, guiding their steps, working in people's hearts. It's like he's the wind in their sails, you know, yeah. propelling them forward into uncharted territory. That's a great way to put it. We see this from the very beginning with that dramatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Right. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Like a spiritual earthquake, right? Man. Shaking things up, setting in motion this incredible movement. It was a defining moment, you know? Yeah. A clear sign of the Holy Spirit's power to equip God's people. And that mission, of course, was to make disciples of all nations. Exactly. To spread that gospel message yeah. to the ends of the earth. And as we've seen, the Holy Spirit is vital to that mission. He empowered them to perform miracles, Acts chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, to preach boldly even with opposition, Acts chapter 4, verse 31, to withstand persecution, Acts chapter 5, verse 41, to discern God's will, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, to establish churches that would continue the mission, Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Wow. It's clear that their success wasn't due to their own doing, right? It was the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through them. It makes you wonder, how can we as believers today tap into that same power? That's the question, isn't it? And I think it starts with recognizing that we need the Holy Spirit. We can't do this on our own. So it's really about surrender. It is. Surrendering our agendas, our plans, that desire to control, and saying, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. It's beautiful. It's about making ourselves available to God, being willing to step out in faith even when things are uncertain. Because it's not about us. It's about his power working through us. And that's where the excitement is. Because when we surrender to the Holy Spirit's leading, it opens us up to a life of adventure, purpose, and yes, even miracles. Speaking of miracles, you mentioned earlier that Acts is full of them. Why do you think they play such an important role in the early church? That's a great question. I think miracles served several purposes. Primarily, they were signs, wonders, pointing to the reality of God. Like exclamation points, emphasizing the truth of the gospel. Exactly. Authenticating the message and the messenger. People couldn't deny what they were seeing. Think about the healing of the lame man in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Talk about a showstopper. Right. It's hard to ignore that kind of tangible evidence. It, it does make you wonder, do miracles still happen today or were they just a first century thing? I think a lot of people wrestle with that question. And while we might not see miracles happening every day, I do believe that God still works in supernatural ways today. Maybe we've just gotten used to the extraordinary, or maybe we've limited our understanding of what a miracle even is. It's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day and lose sight of the miraculous. It really is. But if we open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, we might just see God's hand at work in ways we never imagined. Looking for the extraordinary in the ordinary, recognizing that God is always at work, even in the smallest details. Yes, and that is a message of hope. It reminds us that even when we can't see it, even when we don't feel it, God is still moving, still working, still orchestrating his plan. So we've talked about the historical context, the challenges, the triumphs of that early church, the theology behind it all. As we wrap up, what's the one thing you want our listeners to take away from our conversation today? 
I hope they're inspired by the courage, the faith, the commitment of those early believers. But even more than that, I hope they're challenged to live out their own faith with that same boldness, that same passion, that same reliance on the Holy Spirit. It's called action. It is. Be world changers, difference makers. Step out in faith. Share the hope that we have. The story of Acts isn't just ancient history. It's an invitation. It is. An invitation to experience the transformative power of the gospel and to join God in his mission of redeeming and restoring this broken world. It's a story that's still being written, and we all have a part to play. So let's step into that adventure, embrace the unknown, and just see what God will do. Let's surrender to his leading, allow his spirit to work in and through us.